Excuse me. Okay. It says at the end of, of chapter 20 that uh, there were signs and wonders that Messiah had done. And these signs and these wonders were so that they might believe. Now understand that when he says that you might believe, belief always leads to faithfulness. And faithfulness, that word in the scripture, is related to the truths of God. So his miracles, these signs were all to confirm the truth of God that we might respond obediently. But these disciples, well, we're going to see, were they responding in that way? Did they have that vision that Messiah had placed within them during those three years? Well, we read in verse 1, after these things, Yeshua again appeared to the disciples. And it was along, and don't miss this. It was along the Sea of Tiberias. Now, that phrase, the Sea of Tiberias, should stand out. Because over and over in the New Testament, when we talk about that body of water, it is known as the Sea of Galilee. No, here, only here, the Sea of Tiberias. Now, no Jew would have called this body of water by that name. It was the Romans, think of it, the Sea of Tiberias, after Caesar Tiberius, who was, in one sense, the ruler of the world. And the fact that the Sea of Galilee is called the Sea of Tiberias, it tells us, it gives us a context for what we're studying. The disciples, they had a worldly perspective. They weren't thinking as a Jew, and that term Jew can mean a praiser of God. They weren't thinking about the Lord's perspective, His call upon their life. They were thinking as the world thinks. And we'll see this in a few moments. So, He appeared to them in this manner along the Sea of Tiberias, verse 2. And Simon Peter, and also Thomas. Now, look up for a moment. You know, we've encountered Thomas at the end of John's Gospel. He's that disciple that says, I will not believe unless I see those wounds in his hands and his side. Well, he saw. He was given that, that vision. He touched the place where those nails and the sword went in. So once again, it's to emphasize these signs and these wonders. It should lead to faith. It should cause us to have the perspective of God, to see things from his perspective and be interested in the things that Messiah was interested in, namely the kingdom of God. Now, why do I say that? Well, in the next chapter, you don't need to turn there, but in Acts chapter 1, 
Messiah, it tells us that he has appeared to the disciples and many others over a period of 40 days. Now in the Bible, 40 has to do with the transition or change. You see, there was a change coming upon the disciples. Messiah had told them, you wait here in Jerusalem for the, the fulfillment of my Father's promise. And obviously, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit. And in the midst of this discussion about the Holy Spirit, if you look closely at this first chapter of Acts, in verse 3, it tells us that he taught during those 40 days about the kingdom of God. And we see that connection between the Spirit and the kingdom of God. He says, wait for my promise, that is, wait for the Spirit so that we can be doing the kingdom business. The question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Were these disciples, were they about the kingdom business? Did they have a kingdom perspective? Were they doing the things that, that, that a kingdom character would, would produce? And not only do we have to ask whether they were, we need to make it more personal. Are you? Do you have a kingdom perspective? Are you passionate about the fact that God is going to establish a kingdom here? Are you playing a role in that? Are you demonstrating that character of the kingdom? Well, the disciples, they were there, both Peter and Thomas, and keep reading. It also says Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel, we are told that he's from Cana. Now, you might remember that it was in Cana that the first miracle that Yeshua did took place. So once again, sign, sign for a reason. In fact, that sign was to show that he was the king of Israel. And we also know it tells us that Cana was, where is it? The scripture says, in Galilee. Now, that fact reveals to us, when it says the Sea of Tiberias, it wasn't because they weren't aware that we're talking about the Sea of Galilee. They purposely said the Sea of Tiberias for the reason that we learned. The term Galilee has to do with revealing. And this is what this scripture is about. Revealing to the disciples the purposes of God, the plans of God, the perspective of God. Not only was Nathaniel there, but also the sons of Zebedee. Now, these were two of the four disciples that Messiah called in a very unique way. They were fishermen. And you might recall that he came and said something. Let me ask you, has it ever bothered you that Messiah would go along this Sea of Galilee, see a couple fishermen, in fact, brothers, and he would say to them, follow me and I'll make you fisher of men. And they left their nets, their business, their father, and followed after him. Has that ever bothered you? I mean, can you imagine someone just saying that to you? You leave your job, your family, all your responsibilities to follow after a man? Does that stand out as odd? Well, it wouldn't be if you were a Jewish individual living at that time. Because this expression, fisher of men, was well known. In fact, let me give you a scripture. If you look sometime in the book of Genesis, chapter 48, this is where Jacob, Jacob is, is blessing the sons of Joseph. And around verse 16, this is where Jacob, he crosses his hands, his right over his left, to bless Ephraim and give him that, that, that priority, that, that firstborn right, instead of Manasseh. And he says here, he says, may my name, that is character, may my name be upon these two lads, and, and may they multiply into, now your scripture will simply say, a great multitude upon the earth. But that's not what it says in Hebrew. It uses a verb to mean to multiply as fish. In fact, the word fish actually appears in that word. So when they heard, I'll make you fishers of men, what did they conclude? Well, what they concluded was this messianic prophecy. Because in Genesis 48, 
This passage where Jacob blesses the sons of Joseph, it's known as Birkat HaMashiach, the blessing of Messiah. So when he said that, he was revealing to them that he was the Messiah. That's why they dropped their nets. That's why they left their father. That's why they left their business. Because they were interested in what Messiah was going to bring about. The question is, are you? Are you interested in what Messiah wants to bring about in your life? Or are you living a life of frustration because you are set and determined on Messiah giving to you the life that you want? He's not going to do it. You will be frustrated. You will be disappointed. And what will happen? You'll fall back into that previous way of living. Well, move on to verse 3. Now, in verse 3, Peter says something that I can never imagine saying if I was there. What does he say? He says, I'm going fishing. You say, you don't like to fish? Well, not like they did. I mean, if you're talking to me about the, uh, you know, one of my favorite shows growing up was the Andy Griffith show. Oh, Mayberry. You've seen that, most of you. And they would go out on the lake and they would take a picnic lunch and a, a big orange to drink. And they would cast their line in and relax. I could get into that. But that's not how they fished on the Sea of Galilee. They took nets, heavy nets. They placed them over their shoulder. And they would take them and cast them into the water. Let them sink. And then they would have the, the hard task of pulling them up. And they would do that over and over and over throughout the night, many hours. So Peter is saying, I want to go fishing. Really, Peter? That's what you want to do with your life? To go through this process and more often than not, you didn't catch. I mean, not every time. You had to work long hours for there to be a, a good catch. But what happens here? Well, keep reading. We find in the middle of verse 3, the other disciples, they said to him, also we are going with you. And they went, they entered into the boat, and what do we find? They did not catch anything. And this word means absolutely nothing. Now think of that. Working all night, and these were skilled fishermen. I mean, their father was a fisherman, probably their grandfather and so forth. They knew how to fish. They knew when to fish. And all night, and that's what the text says, all night, and they caught absolutely nothing. Now, you may have a bad day, but to fish and catch nothing, that was unusual. God was at work in their life. Why do I say that? Well, think for a moment, when I read this passage of Scripture in that verse, and how I like to prepare is to read a text and then pray. And when I mean pray, I mean listen to God. Read it again and listen some more and do that over and over. And as I was doing it, I came to this verse, and they caught nothing. What came into my mind was Jacob and Esau. Remember what the Bible says about Esav? It says that he was a mighty, what was he? A mighty hunter. Now, that term mighty means skilled. He was a man that knew the field, is what it literally says. And it's really odd to think that this mighty, this knowledgeable hunter would go out and he would hunt and he would catch absolutely nothing. God was not blessing. In fact, God, it's prophetic, God says he's not going to bless Esau. He's going to bless Jacob. So when these men toiled all night and they caught nothing, God was at work in this situation. In other words, he was not blessing. He did not call them. He did not sanctify them. And by the way, how many apostles or how many disciples were mentioned? You count them up in that, that verse, seven. Seven has to do with sanctification, being set apart for a purpose. 
and they weren't living the purposes of God out, and therefore he wasn't blessing. And that's a principle that still applies today. If God's not blessing, you're not living out your call, which he has given to you for your life. So notice what happens. They catch nothing all night. Verse 4. Now, with the morning, morning has to do with the revelation, shining a light on it. And we're going to see what is the problem. Their problem was with Yeshua, with Jesus. Why do I say that? Verse 4. And with the morning, Yeshua stood upon the shore. But the disciples, they did not recognize him. Now, this is important. Because they had been with him, living with him, every day for the last three years. But this is the resurrected Messiah. And understand, there is an inherent relationship in the scripture between resurrection and kingdom. When Messiah resurrected, he had that kingdom character. He always had it inside. He always demonstrated by behavior. But uh, the scripture says in the book of Isaiah, when we looked at him prior to his resurrection, he wasn't comely. There was nothing uh, special about how he looked. But after the resurrection, he reflected externally the kingdom. And they, when they saw this kingdom, this resurrected man, says they did not recognize Yeshua. And that's always a problem for us. Because he said something. He has said he's never going to leave you or forsake you. In other words, he is always with us. Do we really acknowledge that? Do we really believe that? I mean, oftentimes I do, you do things that if you knew that he was right there with you, if he was visible, I bet you wouldn't do that. I bet you wouldn't think the same thoughts. I bet you would be noticeably different. The problem is we forget that the presence of God is with us. We belong to him. His spirit, if you're a believer, dwells in you. Now move on. They didn't recognize him. Verse 5, he spoke to them. And I want you to see how he addressed these men. Now, your Bible may just simply say, children. But we need to understand that this is not the term, the normal biblical word for children. He's not speaking to them as a spiritual leader that might say, my dear children. That's not how he's speaking. He uses a phrase that speaks about a very small child. One who is immature, one who cannot take care of himself, one, one who can't be left alone. So when he uses this term, it's almost like he's scolding them. He says, uh, little immature children, did you not catch any fish? And this is important because biblically speaking, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. There's going to be, every year, there's a very important festival in the fall of the year. It's called, biblically, the Feast of Trumpets. It's known in Hebrew, commonly as Rosh Hashanah, or the New Year. Now, everyone, New Year's come, and you have expectations. You want a good year. In other words, you want a blessed year. And one of the things that uh, Jewish families do on that night when we celebrate that holiday with a very special meal, we'll have uh, apples and honey because we want a sweet New Year. But something else that's there is a fish. There's always a fish just set on the table. And the reason for this is that biblically and also rabbinically, fish are synonymous with blessing. So you put the fish on your table because you're saying, I want a blessed year. So when Messiah Yeshua says, you didn't catch any fish, what's he saying? You have no blessings. You don't show any of the effects of, of being a child of God, a disciple. There's no evidence of me working in your life. So he says, you have no fish. And they say, uh, no, we have none. 
Well, notice what he responds. Look, if you were, to verse 6. He says to them, cast your net on the right side of the ship, and you will find. Now, how does he know that? I mean, first of all, it's daylight. Fish in the daylight hours, they go down deep. It's harder to catch them. It is not an appropriate time to fish. Fish, they finish for the night. But nevertheless, because he says, cast your net and you will find. How did he know that? Because he's the master of the universe. He is the son of God. Fish obey him. No, not too long ago, I was teaching from the book of Jonah. And one of the things I like about the book of Jonah is that in that book, everything and everyone obeys God. Those sailors, they ended up obeying God. That captain, he obeyed God. The wind, that great fish, that little worm, that gourd, the people of Nineveh, everyone obeyed God in the book of Jonah except for, except for who? Jonah. And what I want you to see is that oftentimes we're like Jonah. That's the disciples. They had the privilege of being intimate with Messiah. They had the privilege of being taught his call upon their life. They don't recognize him. They don't have the blessings. So what do we see here? He says, cast your net upon the right side of the boat. And they did. And what happens? They cast and they were not able, in the verse 6, they were not able to, to pull this net, to pull it, because of the abundance of the fish. All night, over and over and over, scholars tell us that it takes about 10 minutes to cast a net in and pull it up. They, they fished all night, probably around 6 to 8 hours, so times eight, times six, 48 times throughout that night, they cast this in and caught absolutely what? Nothing. And now they do it at his word. And what happens? They catch unusually. This, this large catch of abundant fish. Now, remember, what does fish mean, biblically speaking? Blessings. See, when we obey the word of God, even if from a logical standpoint we would say, this is not the time, this is not the place, we're too close, we'll see this in a moment, we're too close to shore. This is not naturally the time or the place. But if he says, he speaks, he commands, you do it. And the blessings will come. Now here's the problem. He wasn't so interested in speaking about Jesus. He wasn't so interested in those blessings. He was trying to illustrate something. Why do I say that? Keep reading verse 7. Now, when this great abundant catch of fish happened, notice something, verse 7. And the disciple whom Jesus loved, he responded and he said to Peter, this is the miracle worker. Is that what your Bible says? This is the Messiah. No. It's very important. I mean, we could use many different uh, definitions and terms to describe Yeshua. But what's important here is that they use the word, the Lord. And that implies submissiveness. Now, he can make you exceedingly blessed in the things of the world. Is that what you want? What does the scripture say? If a man should, should acquire the whole world, but his soul perish, what profit is there? So he's going to put forth before them a choice. Well, this disciple, whom Jesus loved, he was the first to recognize this is the Lord. Now, who's the first disciple mentioned in this, this passage? Peter. You know, Peter had this, this desire, this, this obsession of being what? First. He always answered. He always stepped out. You, someone's got to walk on the water. I'll do first. He loved to be first. 
He was excitable. And that's okay if you're excitable for the things of God. And what did he do? When he heard that it was the Lord, the scripture says that he tossed himself, everyone else will just take the boat into the shore, not Peter. He plunged himself. That's what it literally say. He plunged himself into the water and he swam there. No. There's a very important fact that the scripture tells us. And if we overlook this, we overlook the foundational truth if we're really going to be children of God in this world. Why do I say it that way? Well, if you are a believer, you have accepted the gospel by God's grace. You're going to be in the kingdom. I hope you want more than that. I hope you want to be useful and be the salt of the earth, the light of the world now. That you want to be a faithful, obedient disciple in this age. Why do I say that? Because what the scripture says is this. Prior to plunging himself into the lake, what did he do? Now, if I was there, if I had a shirt on, I might take off my shirt to dive in. You've seen that. You've seen these movies where the hero, he's going to dive in and save the drowning woman. He takes off his coat, his shirt, his shoes. But Peter did just the opposite. The scripture says he was barebacked. He had removed those work. He had removed his, his cloak. Literally, it's a special term. Does not your Bible say the outer garment? Now, the outer garment is what's known in Hebrew as the arba kanfot, which means the four-corner garment. It's like a shawl that someone wears. And if you look, let me give you a citation. Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 41. There it talks about every Jewish man, he has this four-corner garment, this outer garment, and on each corner, he has to place a specific, unique type of tassel. We call them in Hebrew, tzitzit. And they, if you read that scripture, Numbers 15, verses 37 through 41, they are made in a way whereby they reflect the commandments of God. So I want you to see something. Peter did not want to go before his Lord exposed. That is naked. What does that mean? Well, don't you go before your Lord. See, you're going to be, if you're a believer, you're going to be in the kingdom of God. That's only half the issue. You're also going to go before him in regard to not where you're going to spend eternity, but you are going to be judged, what the scripture says, by your works. Not for salvation, but for what? Rewards. What do you do with those rewards? You cash them in for dollars? No. You lay them at the foot of your Savior. Now, I don't believe that any of us, when that time comes is going to want to go there with what the scripture says. Don't, be, be, don't appear before the Lord your God, how? Empty-handed. That's what the Torah says. So we want to have obedient works in our life. And this garment, see, this is symbolic. This garment represents the commandments, the word of God. And, and Peter, for us, now he probably didn't even think what he was doing. But for the reader, it's significant because it tells us that if we want to go before the Lord, we should do so how? With a mindset based upon the word of God, obedience. See, sometimes people today, they don't want to talk about obedience. What's the name of this congregation? Grace Connection. And let me tell you, biblically speaking, grace saves, but grace also teaches us, so says Titus. To deny ungodliness. So just don't accept a partial grace. Just the grace that saves. Also understand that same grace works in your life to cause you to deny ungodliness and unrighteousness. Where? In this present age. You're not going to have a problem with that in the age to come. The problem, the test, the battle is in this age. And grace is the solution. It leads us to obey. And that's what this is symbolically telling us. Well, let's keep reading. Drop down, if you would, to, to, verse, to verse 7 or 8. In verse 8 it says, But 
the rest of the disciples, they came in this little boat. And what were they doing? Well, they may have been excited that the Lord was on the shore. But they were also thinking about what? That great catch of fish. I mean, this fish, this fish represented what? Money. And, and they had the, the mindset, you know what? I like to, to take the things, the blessings of this world and, and God and kind of put them together. Now, you can't do that. You can't do that. Why do I say that? Well, I live in a city in Israel called Ashdod. Now, this is mentioned, believe it or not, several places in the scripture. One of which is in the book of Samuel. Remember when the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines? What did they do with it? They brought the Ark of the Covenant into their pagan temple and they put it next to their pagan idol. See, this is what they do. They want to mix pagan, the things of the world, with the things of God. How did that go for them? Not very well. And what we're trying to see in this passage is this. You know what? What does the scripture say? What profit is it if a man gains the whole world and what? He loses his soul. Don't, don't sacrifice for things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Don't delay in trying to go before the Lord by, by being attached to the thoughts and the blessings of this world. So look again, verse, verse 8. The rest of the disciples, they came in that little boat, and they were dragging the net with the fish. For they were not so far from the shore, they were, what does your Bible say? Now, many interpret the scripture rather than translate it. Why do I say that? Well, the text says, literally, if you have a good Bible, an accurate Bible, it will tell you that it's 200 cubits they were from the shore. Some Bibles say like 100 yards. Now, that's true. That's the distance. But the revelation is in the literal text. Why? Two. Whether it's 2, 20, 200, 2,000. Whenever two appears in the Bible, it shows two divergent opinions. And that's what those six disciples had. They had an opinion that you can bring the things of the world and the things of God together. Many people are teaching today why God is, is to make me successful in this world. He is, if you understand success. Success and prosperity, success is having everything I need to serve God. Prosperity is, I'm rich in good works. Now, you may be rich in this world, poor in this world, that's secondary. The thing is, am I obeying God? Do I do the works that God has placed before me? Well, move on to verse 9. When they finally came up upon the shore, they saw the coals that they had been arranged, and there's fish that had been laid upon them. Now, don't miss this. This fish that Yeshua was preparing, he had made the coals, he had placed fish, but not those fish that were caught that day, that morning, from the Sea of Galilee. He had his fish. Now, there's a a hermeneutical clue, an aid to help us understand and interpret this. Not only are fish mentioned here, but what else? Bread. Loaves. Does that sound familiar to you? Remember that miracle twice? He fed 5,000, another time 4,000. He fed them fish and bread. Now let me ask you, although he had two fish and five little loaves of bread, most of the people did not eat from that small portion. I mean, he fed 5,000, 4,000. Where did all that fish come from? He spoke and there was the blessing from heaven. This, these fish came supernaturally. And I would suggest to you, same thing here. When they, and they're going to eat, when they partook of this, they were not partaking of the blessings of of this world. 
they were partaking from the supernatural blessings that Messiah provided them. And that's the choice that we have to have. Do we want the things of this world? Go and take. Or do you want the things of God, the blessings that he has prepared for you? Verse 10. Yeshua said to them, bring from the fish which you caught at this moment. So that tells us, well, his fish is not their fish. He wanted to show them something. Now, when Peter went, here again, always first. He went, he pulled the net, he uncovered it, he took some fish, and he saw that all the fish, don't miss this, all the fish that they caught that day, they were large. Literally, the word is great fish. Now, I'm not a fisherman, but I've been on the Sea of Galilee. I've watched the fisher boats go out. And I've seen them come in and they toss their net in what's called the shuk, the marketplace. And you know what type of fish you see when they have a good catch? You see big fish, little fish. You see fish that are black fish, silver fish. I feel like Dr. Seuss this morning. But you see all types of fish. Here, not so. The only type of fish, and this is miraculous, the only type of fish that were caught that day were large, great fish. I mean, if you want the success of this world, God can give it to you. He can do supernatural blessings. If he wants you to have them, he can do it. But the focus, what they actually partook of that day was the blessings of of Messiah. The last thing I want to share with you is this. See, numbers are important in the scripture. And what we find, and Messiah was the one behind this, he says, you know, let's look at this fish. All these great fish, but the important thing is, there was 153. Now, if it was me, I would just round 150. Actually, it was me, I probably, I like to exaggerate, more than 200 fish probably. No. Specific. 153 fish. Numbers are important in the scripture. And I would suggest to you that what Messiah wants us to take from this passage has to do with the fish. And fish are synonymous with what? Blessings. Here's how you live a blessed life. 153, what does that number mean? Well, whether we're talking about 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000, whenever there's a multiplicity of 10, we need to think of completion, wholeness, entirety. So what we have here is something in absolute terms. That's 100. 50, well, when you hear that in the scripture, what should come into your mind? And the answer is, jubilee every 50 years there's a jubilee year if you do a good study of what the scripture says about jubilee we find that moses gives a word this word doesn't appear too often in the scripture it's the hebrew word dwar which means an absolute and unique freedom it is very similar to the concept that when we read in the scripture that the children of israel came out of egypt what were they in egypt Slaves. They were in bondage. A few weeks ago, we celebrated Passover. We sat at the table, and it says each year we read that we were slaves in Egypt, but now we're sons of freedom. And that word freedom, Aramaic, is, is paralleled by the sages to this word, dwar. And it means freedom, but it's not the word chofesh. Why do I say that? Chofesh is a modern Hebrew word, it means freedom, but it's a modern Hebrew word for, for vacation. You know, that's when you leave your boss, you don't all do what he wants any longer on your vacation, you do what who wants? You want. You determine where you go. You determine where you stay, where you do during that time. When the vacation, the chofish is over, you're under the authority of the boss. But scripturally, this word redemption, 
That's what the Feast of Passover is about. It gives us drawer. It gives us a freedom. And what's that freedom? To be set free of the bondage of sin that we might be free to do what? Serve God. See, 153. Three means revealing. This whole passage, this miracle, is about the fact God wants to reveal to you that he can do all things. That he's never going to leave you or forsake you. His presence is with you. And he wants to make you successful in his blessings. What he wants to provide for you. He's going to meet that need. And let me tell you something. A wise person would rather have the fish that he prepared than those fish from the Sea of Galilee. He wants to set you free from the things of this world that you might enjoy his blessings and the outcome of his blessings is you manifesting his presence, his power, his anointing, and his purposes in your life. And when you do that, you know what? Life gets exciting. When you do that, you begin to experience God in a very unique way. When you do that, you're not going to be thinking about the past. You're not going to be like Lot's wife and look back at what was. You're going to press on. You're going to press on that upward call. Why an upward call? God's going to lift you up so you can see things from his perspective. God wants to do mighty things in your life. And the greatest hindrance to that being a reality is us thinking about what it was, what this world is to us, rather than realizing that this world and all of its blessings should be nailed to that cross because God has something far better better for us in this age and in the age to come. Father God, we do love you. Help us to reflect that love, demonstrate that love to others so that they might see that you are the Lord of our life. God, we don't want the fish of this world. We want what you want to provide to us, that we might acknowledge your presence in our life and because of that presence, that your glory your righteousness, your power might be seen in and through us as we bless others. When we listen to their hurt, we spend time with them who are lonely. We give clothes and drink and food to those who are thirsty, naked, and hungry. That we might minister in a way that you have equipped us to do so. So that your glory is seen and there's praise of who you are among your people. In the blessed name of Messiah Yeshua, we pray. Amen.